we continue to read in the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, you may want to open up your Bible and follow along. This is the middle part of uh, Matthew 5 we'll be looking at. As I was growing up, there was always another Disney movie coming out, right? Aladdin, uh, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King. But the one, in my personal opinion, that had the best music of all of them was The Little Mermaid. Just loved it. Great music. The story of this, uh, everyone's seen Little Mermaid, story of a mermaid, fascinated by the land, wants to go uh, meet her prince, has studied all she can about the land and trades her voice for her legs and... I, I, did anyone else watch that movie and wonder why didn't someone go up to her and say, I know you can't talk, but can you use a pen? I mean, why didn't anyone think at, at any point? I, I, I don't know why. Uh, that's, that, that's not my biggest problem with the movie, though. As much as I love the uh, music, I have a hard time watching people make a fool of themselves because I have a bit of a hang-up of looking like a fool myself. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And uh, even animated, I have a hard, hard time watching people make a fool of themselves. So scenes like this, I have a hard time watching. Uh, yeah, hit the next one. So she's meeting her prince, she's all gussied up. Oh, Eric, isn't she a vision? Uh, you look wonderful. Come, she come, can't come, talk. Come, She's straight to her voice through the legs. Let me help you, my dear. There, oh, there we go. Ah, that's better. Ah, quite comfy. Hmm? <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, not often that we have such a lovely dinner guest, eh, Eric? I still can't watch it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. All right, what's happening here? Ariel is, uh, she's sitting there and, and she thinks she knows what the fork is for. She's never seen one used before, but uh, to the best of her knowledge, what's the correct, correct thing to do with a fork? Brush your hair, right? And if you just look at a fork and you knew nothing about it, to use it to brush your hair, not a horrible idea, right? You could do it. It would work. Not well, but it would work. And, uh, and then I'm sure that what happens next is she is shown how to use the fork, and then uh, they cruise to the very predictable Disney big marriage wedding happily ever after ending, because that's how they all ended. What we have in scripture today is much like Ariel using a fork to brush her hair. We have uh, a group of people using something in a way that's almost right, but kind of misses the point. What we have today is the Pharisees using the law in a way that makes as much sense as Ariel brushing her hair with a fork, and Jesus showing up to, sh to show them a better way. So how were the Pharisees using the law? How were the Pharisees using the law? They're using the law to keep people in line. The law is something to be afraid of. The law is something to fear. The law is something you better, you're better off not having any interaction with. Is anyone here willing to admit to have watched a rather horrible movie by Sylvester Stallone called Judge Dredd? Did anyone catch that? You're better off. I lament those are two, years, two hours of my life I will never get back. But the, the movie is based on uh, this dystopic future, this city that's out of control, and, and there are cops, j judges, that uh, are dressed uh, with like, huge battle armor, and they have really big guns, and they show up, and, and, and Sylvester Stallone shows up and says, I am the law! That horrible accent, or whatever he has. I'm not sure it's an accent. And then he proceeds to just pound the daylights out of anyone who has broken the law. And, and that's kind of how the law is seen by Pharisees, and honestly by some of us today. The law is scary and intimidating and not to be messed with. The law is something that controls people out of fear. You follow the law out of fear and if you break the law you either get caught or you feel guilty about breaking it. From this point of view of the law, Jesus is the bad guy because he breaks the law. He doesn't fast properly. He doesn't clean properly before meals. He doesn't keep Sabbath correctly. He, he's always eating with the wrong people, the, the other law breakers. This view of the law, this view of the law as what uh, keeps people from doing wrong, this, this law is something that is scary, was not how the law was originally given. It's not how it was originally intended to be used. If you go back to Mount Sinai, the law was given as a gift of guidance 
to a group of people who needed to learn how to live. They, they had been slaves for a long time and they were given the law so that they might learn to live at peace with each other and with God as they traveled towards the promised land. It was the law that pointed them in the right direction. Here's how you're going to live. Here's where you're going to go. Here's what you're going to look like as, as you do it. And, and the law laid out what they should look like for individuals and for community, for the whole community. And there were some leverages, some punishments put in place so that if you strayed, you would be brought back in line and you all continue to travel together. But what happened over the centuries was that instead of maintaining the focus on the law as pointing us in a certain direction, the focus became on the punishments. The law was not something to direct us and to guide and to inspire, but something to fear, because it's going to get you. If, you. if you break the law, the law is going to get you. Right? That became the attitude. And I think we see what a difference this makes when you ask yourself two simple questions. What is the most impressive thing you've done out of, out of fear? Right? Think about what's the, what's the most impressive thing you've done out of fear or shame or guilt? You ever do anything really impressive out of fear? No. What's the most impressive thing you've done because you were inspired, or because it was beautiful, or because you loved someone? You've done great things out of love and awe and beauty, right? The law will keep your grass from getting more than this tall. It is being inspired by beauty that will make you spend the time to actually landscape it, right? That's, that's kind of the difference getting at here. The law is something we avoid because it causes shame and guilt, and at best will be mediocre, following the law so that the law doesn't get us. But if the law is pointing us towards a better way of life as God's people, if it's something to inspire us, that's something different. What Jesus is doing on this section on the Sermon on the Mount is reclaiming the law as something that points us in the direction of living as God's people. Not something to cause fear. Not the law is something that's going to get you if you break it. But it's something that points towards life that is beautiful and fulfilling. He makes this claim against what the Pharisees were teaching. And then he gives us examples of what this looks like. Because this is all kind of philosophical and esoteric. He then gets down into the weeds and says, For example... You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. I say to you, don't even look at women with lust. It, it, don't even look at women in that fashion. The Pharisees had taught, it's not a sin unless you do it. Right? And so you could think about, it. I'm speaking as a male here, flip this if you're female. Uh, you, can, you can lust after women all day long, but as long as you keep your pants on, you're okay. Right? That's what the Pharisees would taught. As long as you don't actually take your pants off and jump in bed with another person, anything you think is fine. And from the point of view of the law is what's to keep us from doing something wrong, that, that's about right. But that's much like, that's like putting a chain on a dog that, that, that snaps and snarls and, and, and tries to bite everyone who walks by. Let's say you've got a dog and you chain it up in your yard and every time someone walks up, it tries to bite him and snap at him and, and, and hollers at him and they haven't bit anyone yet. Would you call that dog a good dog? Or would you call it a dog that hasn't bitten anyone yet? Right? If the law is just there to restrain, that, 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 okay. But what, what would be better than having a dog that you're always worried about biting? What would be better than that? What about having a good dog, right? Wouldn't that be far better? Have a dog that is wonderful and tamed and trained so it runs up and it licks the people's, well, I mean, I think that'd be cool, licks their face and curls up in their, in their lap. Wouldn't that be far better than having a dog you always have to worry about biting someone? That's kind of the logic here. Don't, it's not that... It's not enough to say just chain yourself and don't do the worst case thing. The law is pointing us towards doing even better than that. Don't lower your standards. Don't rationalize. Don't excuse such behavior. Don't think about it. Don't fantasize about it. Because once you start thinking in certain ways, then you might do it. You're, you're taking a step down the path to actually doing it. If the, remember that the law is not supposed to be a chain to hold us back from doing the very worst. It's supposed to inspire us to being the very best. So the part in the law about don't commit adultery is, sa is not saying at least keep your pants on but think whatever you want. It's saying don't even think about adultery. Become people who can't even imagine 
committing adultery, can't even conceive of it, would never look at anyone else in such a way that it would even be an option, right? Become people who are so committed to their marriage and to each other that it's just, it's not even conceivable, right? It, Jesus continues uh, talking about divorce, and it's the same type of thing. The way that divorce was being done back then, it might sound a little bit familiar to what happens today, is that if you wanted to shack up with a woman, you could marry them, and as long as you gave them a certificate of a divorce afterwards, as long as you filled out your paperwork, you were fine. Right? You preserved their reputation, you preserved your reputation, you, get, you divorced them, and, and you were, that, that was fine. They could go on and everyone was good, right? No. You know, I, I know people have been married three, four, five times. And, and what, is, what is that? I mean, I don't know what to make of that. Is that what God intended when God says, don't get a divorce and honor marriage? What God, the law that says don't get a divorce is not about saying, you know what, if you do get a divorce, at least do the paperwork right. It's saying, get married to stay married and to be committed and to not even conceive of doing anything else, but to get married with the intention and the hope and the desire to be married forever till death do you part. Right? Oaths were being treated in the same fashion. Jesus calls out people for making oaths. And there was another sort of uh, paperwork type of trickery being done around oaths. For in that day and age, oaths were understood to be only as binding as the collateral upon which they were sworn. And so if you swore an oath on the hair of your head, how much work does it take to snap a hair out of your head? Done, right? So if you swore an oath on the hair of your head, how binding was that oath? Not very at all, right? So instead, you would, if you swore an oath on the earth on which you walked, that would be more binding. Even more binding than that would be swearing a, an oath on the heaven in which God lives. So, and then there was another sort of piece of trickery being used. You would say, uh, if God wills. You'd swear this oath uh, on earth upon which you walk, if God wills. And so if, uh, if, you, if I promised, I'll check your cattle while you're gone. I'll, te I'll check your cattle while you're gone. And then a thunderstorm happened and you said, I swear it on the earth on which I walk, if God wills. And there was a thunderstorm and it got hard. Obviously, God did not will you to check the cattle and so you didn't have to keep your word. Right? And then the person come back, their cattle hasn't been checked, and you know, oh, God didn't will it. I didn't do what I said I'd do. And Jesus says, none of that. No, 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 no. If you say that you're going to check the cattle, check the cattle. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. None of these oaths, none of these trickeries. None of these... Does it remind you what we do with contracts today in fine print? Yeah. Ugh. The final thing we'll look at today of, of these examples uh, Jesus gives is uh, murder. Jesus says, you shall not commit murder. Whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother, whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the court, be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Remember, Jesus cares as much about motivation and what we think as what we do because they're connected. What we're thinking about leads to what we're going to do. And so once we want, I mean, that's back to the adultery thing, right? Once you start thinking about it and rationalizing it, you've taken the first step towards doing it. So don't even think about it. This is in that same line of thought. Don't even say raka to your brother. Now, raka is not like being annoyed because someone took the last piece of chicken. Raka is actually exactly what it sounds like. If you make the sound, <coughs> Isn't that disgusting? What do you make that sound like before you do? What, what, what leads next? If you walk up to someone and go, oh, you're going to spit on them, right? This is what it's talking about. It's, it's such a, it, it is kind of nasty to read, but that's what it says. If you, if you are willing to, to rock on someone, if you're willing to spit on them, don't even do that. Then you're, you are guilty. Because what happens, is, who are you willing to spit on? Right? Who do you spit? You spit on someone who is lesser than you. And once someone is lesser than you, once you've shown them that type of contempt, what's the, how far do you have to go from thinking that they're lesser than you to treating them like they're lesser than you? 
The extreme versions of this would be like slavery, right? It's easy to enslave someone if you treat them as property, if they're lesser than you. If you can spit on them, like rock on them, and treat, and you think of them as less, then you can treat them as less, and then you can murder them because they are less than you, and yeah, well, whatever, just take, them, think, take out the trash, whatever. And, and it's the same type of, of logic. The purpose of the law, remember, is not to stop you from getting caught. It's not to, to keep us from being too bad. The purpose is to help us become better, to point us towards the best way to live. And so it's not, it's not don't murder. It's don't even treat someone in a way such that you could even conceive of doing them ill. Don't hold others in contempt. Don't look down on them. Don't spit on others. Don't stay angry at others. Uh, Jesus further says, if you are presenting your offering and you remember that your brother is angry at you, go get straight with them. Don't let that sit there and fester. The term he uses for anger there is the term used to describe uh, fruit that is spoiling. You ever see fruit that goes so rotten that it explodes? That sort of festering, it just sits there and sits there and sits there until it explodes and you have to wash up your... I think that happens with melons, right? That's what the, is being described here, that festering anger. If you're festering with anger at someone, don't, don't, don't even go to church and try to say, you know what, God, I'm, it's just you and me and I'm sorry. No, just go to the person and get straight with them before you do anything else. Don't, don't murder, don't uh, look down on people, don't get contemptuous of others, don't even stay angry at others. That's what Jesus is laying out here. That's the purpose of the law, to point us towards being at peace. Right? Love, your, love your neighbor and, and love God. That, that's how, how this starts to, to unfold. Jesus is reclaiming the law as a, something to inspire us. And, and I want to leave you with one last way to maybe think through this. Think of the person or the couple who you admire most. The person or the couple you admire most for they are, they are wise or patient or gentle, uh, the people who have been the most sacrificially loving in your life. Think of who the, that is. Uh, for me, uh, Wendell and Von Dean Quigley have just been an, always an amazing example uh, of gracious, patient love. I was their pastor down when they were at Lake Nehe. And um, by no means were they perfect, but they were wise and gracious and kind and patient with me, a brand new pastor out of seminary, and uh, I'm very thankful for that. And, and Wendell would come up uh, and he would help me serve communion on a regular basis. And it took me a long time to realize he wasn't helping me serve communion, I was helping him. And thanks be to God, he was gracious enough to let me figure that out myself. It took me a few years, right? Yeah. But he was the heart of that community. He was patient and kind and wise and gentle. And, and uh, he was a great man. He was a great man. God gave us the law to help me be more like Wendell. Because the saints are the people we can look at and say, God can do that in someone's lives, and I can do that too. And the law is the tools that God gave me to be more like Wendell, and that God gave you so that you can be more like that person that you're thinking of right now. Thanks be to God. Amen.